This episode of The History Guy brought to you by Mova Globes. Stay tuned to the end of the episode to learn more. In 1522, Juan Sebastian del Cano completed what is generally accepted to have been the first circumnavigation of the globe. It was a daunting journey that took more than three years, and less than one in three people who left on the journey safely returned home. But some three and a half centuries later, changes in both technology and infrastructure suddenly put circumnavigation of the globe in the hands of the common person. In 1873, French author Jules Verne published one of the most popular adventure novels ever written around the world in 80 days. It was a product of its time, and it sparked an extraordinary race to beat that record. That time of optimism when we first realized that the world was within our grasp deserves to be remembered. When author Jules Verne published Around the World in 80 Days, first published in French as a serial in the Paris newspaper Le Temps in 1872, and then in book form in 1873, and finally as a play, first performed in Paris in 1874, he was in need of money. He was very much a successful author, having published many works, notably uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth in 1864 and 20,000 Leagues Under the Seas in 1870, but his earlier works didn't produce royalties, and so didn't provide a steady stream of income. Around the World in 80 Days would be one of his most acclaimed works, and the income from the play that he co-authored with French playwright Adolphe Dennery ended his financial worries. The novel follows the adventures of wealthy Englishman Phileas Fogg, sometimes called Phineas in later English translations, and his French valet Jean Passepartout, as they seek to win a wager made in the London Reform Club. Remarking on a newspaper story about a new railway section opened in India, Fogg bets half his fortune with his fellow club members that he can travel around the world in just 80 days. Then follows a series of adventures involving not just steamships and trains, but also an elephant and a wind-powered sleigh. Most of Verne's works were set in the latter part of the 19th century. They were carefully researched and incorporated new technologies at the time, and served as such an advertisement for those developments that Verne's works have been cited as an inspiration for both authors and scientists in the invention and development of important technologies from submarines to helicopters to rockets. That was certainly true of Around the World in 80 Days. In fact, the newspaper story that drives the plot, purportedly published in the London Daily Telegraph, represents one of the key developments that made rapid circumnavigation of the globe possible, the linking of the railways on the Indian subcontinent. Proposals for rail lines in British India began at least as early as the 1830s, and freight rails were operating in parts of the subcontinent by 1837. The first passenger line, a section of the Great Peninsula Railway, opened on April 13, 1853, a date generally considered to be the beginning of the Indian railway system, a system that is still an important mode of transportation, carries a stunning 8 billion passengers annually today. The routes continued to develop, and on March 7, 1870, the Great Indian Peninsula Railway opened a line from Bombay to Jabalpur, where it connected to a branch of the East Indian Railway, allowing for the first time continuous passenger rail from Bombay to Calcutta. This line meant that travel across the subcontinent that used to take weeks could be accomplished in just a few days. This had not only an impact on the time for a traveler like Phileas Fogg to cross the subcontinent, but had a massive economic and social impact as well. Remarking on a visit by the Duke of Edinburgh to inaugurate the line, the Raja of Kolhapur said, The commercial and social intercourse which this railway line will facilitate between districts of India, hitherto separated by wide rivers and stupendous mountain chains, cannot fail to have an important influence on the moral and material prosperity of the varied races inhabiting this vast country. But while this was the development that sparked the bet in Verne's book, it was part of a broader story. There were two other important developments at the time. While attempts to connect the Mediterranean to the Red Sea via the Isthmus of Suez go back to antiquity, work on the modern canal wasn't started until 1859. Working under French businessman Ferdinand de Lesseps, some 30,000 workers at any given time, including forced labor for the first five years before the practice was abandoned, dug the first canal in 10 years. It opened November 17, 1869, saving nearly two weeks travel, depending upon the speed of the ship, over crossing around the Cape of Good Hope. The combination of the Suez Canal and the linking of the Indian railways had a significant impact on trade in India. But the traveler trying to circumnavigate the globe still had the great obstacle of North America, and thus the third great development that made Fogg's journey possible, the Transcontinental Railroad. 
The United States had obvious reasons to try to connect its coast via railroad, with the alternative being lengthy and dangerous crossing either across the jungle of Panama or via the Cape Horn. Plans began in the 1840s, and routes were surveyed in the 1850s, but Congress was unable to come to an agreement on appropriating funds because of arguments between northern and southern states over the route, a so-called central route across the Rockies to Sacramento, or a southern route across Texas and New Mexico to Los Angeles. The impasse was actually broken by the Civil War, as the secession of the southern states removed the opposition to the central route in the Senate. The Pacific Railroad Act was passed in 1862. The line between Sacramento and Omaha was completed on May 10, 1869, another event that was said to have inspired Jules Verne. The time saved was significant. Sea travel by clipper ship between New York and California took three to four months, whereas travel by stage from California to Missouri could take four to five months, although mail using horse relays via the Pony Express could make the trip in around 10 days. With the Transcontinental Railroad, you could make the trip in some 70 to 80 hours. These three developments, as well as continuing developments in steamship travel, made the journey of Phileas Fogg possible. In fact, Verne had inspiration at the time. In 1870, American William Perry Fogg began a voyage from Cleveland, Ohio to Japan, becoming one of the first Americans to travel through the interior of Japan. He then traveled through China, India, and through the Suez Canal. Fogg's letters on his approximately two-year voyage were published in American newspapers. William Fogg was somewhat unlike the fictional Fogg in Verne's book. He traveled from west to east, the opposite direction from the book. He was not traveling in a hurry to win a bet, and that defines possibly the biggest difference. While the fictional Phileas Fogg paid little attention to the places he visited, William Fogg showed a keen interest. His letters are full of descriptions of the scenery, as well as of the political and economic situation and history of the places he visited. Several authors have suggested that William Fogg was the inspiration for the character of Phileas Fogg. However, others suggested the inspiration was another American, entrepreneur George Francis Train, who had been involved in the construction of the Transcontinental Railway. Train was an eccentric and progressive who ran for president in 1872. In 1870, he decided to take an around-the-world trip that was covered in many American newspapers. Although he was gone for more than 80 days, Train made the trip in 80 days traveling time. In between that time, he took to building tramways in Britain and spent two months supporting the revolution called the Paris Commune, and two more weeks under arrest after its collapse. It is likely that Verne would have been acquainted with both these men, but he had many other sources of inspiration. In 1872, Englishman Thomas Cook, a pioneer of the tourism industry, organized his first round-the-world trip for tourists. The trip was scheduled to last 222 days and left from New York, going west across the U.S. to Japan, China, Ceylon, India, and then through the Suez. Cook published an account of the trip in 1873 that would have been too late to have inspired Byrne, but some accounts say that he was inspired when he saw an advertisement for the trip in a newspaper. But while there was plenty to inspire Jules Verne's book when it was written, 16 years later there was still a problem. No one had yet actually gone around the world in 80 days. Elizabeth Cochran Seaman was an American journalist who wrote under the pen name Nellie Bly. In 1887, she'd gone on an undercover assignment in New York City's Women's Lunatic Asylum for Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper, The New York World, investigating reports of brutality and neglect. The resulting articles in a later book helped to spark reforms in the system, as well as established her reputation as a pioneer in the field of investigative journalism. In 1888, she went to Pulitzer with a daring plan. Inspired by the popularity of Verne's book, she wanted him to send her around the world to see if it really could be done in 80 days. She later explained, This idea came to me one Sunday. I had spent a greater part of the day and half the night vainly trying to fasten on some idea for a newspaper article. It was my custom to think up ideas on Sunday and then lay them before my editor for his approval or disapproval on Monday. But ideas didn't come that day, and three o'clock in the morning found me weary and with an aching head tossing about in my bed. At last, tired and provoked at my slowness in finding a subject, something for the week's work, I thought fretfully, I wish I was at the other end of the earth. And why not? The thought came. I need a vacation. Why not take a trip around the world? She left on her trip a year later, on November 14, 1889, at 9.40 a.m., boarding the German liner Augusta Victoria. She took with her a single satchel. She wrote, One never knows the capacity of an ordinary hand satchel until dire necessity compels the exercise of all one's ingenuity to reduce everything to the smallest possible compass. In mine, I was able to pack two traveling caps, three veils, a pair of slippers, a complete outfit of toilet articles, inkstand, pens, pencils, and copy paper, 
pins, needles, and thread, a dressing gown, a tennis blazer, a small flask, and a drinking cup, several complete changes of underwear, a liberal supply of handkerchiefs and fresh rutchings, and most bulky and uncompromising of all, a jar of cold cream to keep my face from chapping in the very climates I should encounter. If that seems Spartan for a trip around the world, she noted, it will seem that if one is traveling simply for the sake of traveling and not for the purpose of impressing one's fellow passengers, the problem of baggage becomes a very simple one. But as she traveled eastward using established steamship and rail routes, she was unaware of another event. Having seen Pulitzer's advertisement for Bly's trip, John Brisbane Walker, owner of the New York magazine Cosmopolitan, decided to send his own reporter, Elizabeth Bisland, on a competing trip. She later wrote, On the 14th of November, I received of the coming thunderbolt out of the serene sky of my existence, a hurried and mysterious request, at half past ten o'clock, that it would come as soon as possible to the office of the magazine of which I was one of the editors. My appetite for mystery at that hour of the day is always lamentably feeble, and it was nearly eleven before I found time to go and investigate this one, although the office in question was only a few minutes' walk from my residence. On arriving, the editor and owner of the magazine asked if I would leave New York that evening for San Francisco and continue from there around the world, endeavoring to complete the journey in some absurdly inadequate space of time. Bly did not become aware of Bislin's trip until she reached Hong Kong, opining there that it didn't matter to her as she was not engaging in a race. Bly found time along the way to meet Jules Verne, lamenting that she appeared travel-stained and comically noting the limits of conversation with Verne's wife, Honoré. Her knowledge of the English language consisted of no, and my French vocabulary consisted of we. Oui. To keep interest, the world created a contest where readers could guess her arrival time, with the winner being awarded a trip to Europe. She sent dispatches by cable along the way, but delayed train schedules and rough weather across the Pacific created a problem. When she arrived in San Francisco on January 21st, she was two days behind schedule, and the regular train schedule would not get her back to New York before her 80 days had expired. Bisland was traveling the opposite direction. Exhausted, she had arrived in England too late, she thought, to catch her last ride, the liner SS Ems, and was forced to take a slower ship. Pulitzer, meanwhile, chartered an express train just for Nellie, coined the Miss Nellie Bly Special. The train of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad broke the transcontinental record, traveling from San Francisco to Chicago in just 69 hours. Nellie Bly arrived back in New York 72 days, 6 hours, and 11 minutes after leaving, the world record for a trip around the world. She cataloged, On my tour, I traversed the following waters. North River, New York Bay, Atlantic Ocean, English Channel, Adriatic Sea, Ionian Sea, Mediterranean Sea, Suez Canal, Gulf of Suez, Red Sea, Straits of Bal Ab Mandeb, Gulf of Aden, Arabian Sea, Indian Ocean, Straits of Malacca, China Sea, Pacific Ocean, San Francisco Bay. I visited or passed through the following countries, England, France, Italy, Egypt, Japan, the United States, and the following British possessions, Aden, Arabia, Colombo, Isle of Ceylon, Penang, Prince of Wales Island, Singapore, Malay Peninsula, and the island of Hong Kong. And yet she wrote that the trip was over all too soon to please me, for my trip was so pleasant, I dreaded the finish of it. Bisland completed her journey in 76 days. The Indiana Daily Argus News wrote, Miss Bisland would probably have put the world in a hole by producing a bigger sensation than the world's if she had not met with bad luck. Still, she beat Phileas Fogg's 80 days. She wrote, The ship slides into dock. I can see the glad faces of my friends upon the pier. My journey is done. I have been around the world in 76 days. The transformation in transportation technology and world infrastructure that allowed this competition represented a period of great optimism about how technology might change the world and bring people closer together. The travels of Phileas Fogg and Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland really represented how much the world changed in the last part of the 19th century, and it would continue to change. George Train, when he heard of Nellie Bly's record, decided he would circumnavigate the globe again. He beat her record, making the trip in 67 days, 12 hours, and 1 minute. By 1913, the record was less than 36 days. Today, a standard jet airliner could make the trip theoretically in about 45 hours. Both Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland would become important journalists and well-recognized authors. Nellie Bly would eventually earn two patents for her inventions. She passed away from pneumonia in 1922 at the age of 57. Elizabeth Bisland passed away in 1929 at the age of 67. Both women are buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, 
New York. This eye-catching blue and gold MOVA globe puts a contemporary twist on the map of the world. Its beautiful cerulean blue oceans and gold landmasses are truly spectacular in the spirit of Phileas Fogg and Nellie Bly. And like all MOVA globes, it spins all by itself. There's no batteries, there's no wires, all it needs is ambient light and the Earth's own magnetic field. I own several of these MOVA globes, I truly enjoy them, and they never cease to draw attention if you put them on a desk or a shelf. And they make great gifts. Right now, these new limited edition globes are available, and History Guy viewers get a special discount. Check out the video description for more details. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.